Right, so we're gonna have a look at the next definition, the deviation from social norms. And quickly, let's just recap. Remember, all the AO1 is the theory, the definitions. The AO3 is all about evaluation, the strengths, the limitations of the definition. So if we look at the definition, so we've really got to start with what a social norm actually is. And social norms are society's unwritten rules for what we consider normal and acceptable. What does our society consider to be normal behavior? They're not written down in a book. They're not written down anywhere. They're not typed up. You can't find them on the internet. But there's something that we all know and we all consider to be acceptable. And any behavior that deviates away from this is going to be considered abnormal. So if it goes against these unwritten rules, it's an abnormal behavior. It could be something like someone laughing at a funeral or shouting out and swearing in the middle of a class. We know they're not normal. OK, those behaviors are not normal behaviors. They're not written down somewhere, but we accept them as social norms. You shouldn't laugh in a, in a funeral. You shouldn't be shouting out and swearing in a classroom. And as an example, politeness and manners. OK, it's one of the main social norms in our society. We accept people to be nice, polite, and it's a way that our society has managed to get on with each other. These are the social norms and anything that deviates from these is considered abnormal. So we're going to go on and have a look at the weaknesses of this definition. So one of the main weaknesses is this idea of historical issues. OK, if we look at homosexuality, homosexuality in the past may have been dealt with by someone being put in jail, even being put to death because it was seen as socially deviant. However, perceptions change over time. Now it's considered completely normal. People can get married, can have civil ceremonies, whereas in the past, it was considered abnormal. And this definition can't really account for that. The fact that our perception of behavior changes over time. So it ignores historical issues. A further limitation is the fact that it ignores cultural issues as well. So in certain cultures like African cultures and some Jamaican cultures, it's considered normal for people to talk to the dead. Whereas in our society, you'd be considered maybe potentially schizophrenic or with some sort of mental disorder. So what's considered normal in one culture isn't necessarily considered normal in another culture. It's normal in Africa, maybe to speak to the dead. It's not normal in the UK. And these social norms can vary from culture to culture. So it's very, very difficult to have a universal standard for what can be considered normal because each culture has their own way of doing things and to try and create one definition for every culture is pretty difficult. Another limitation is that it doesn't consider the actual context of the situation. This definition can't distinguish between different contexts. So if we look at someone who is semi-naked, okay, that is completely normal on a beach. Okay, you might have your swimming trunks on, semi-naked, but it's absolutely fine in that context. If you put that person in a different context, such as a classroom, then suddenly they're considered abnormal. Normal on the beach, abnormal when they're in a classroom. And this definition can't make that distinction. And that's a major limitation because it can't distinguish between what is normal and what is abnormal in different contexts. It also can't distinguish between what is abnormal and what can be considered eccentric behavior. So someone who likes dressing up, wearing really, really, really bright clothing. Is that normal? Is that abnormal? This definition can't make that distinguish or distinguish between those two different behaviors. Right, so we've had a look at a few of the weaknesses of this definition, but it does have one major strength, and that's the fact that it can distinguish between desirable and undesirable behaviors. So it sees something like a high IQ as maybe it does deviate from social norms, but it's a desirable behavior. This definition has that ability. If you remember back to statistical infrequency, it couldn't do that. 
an IQ of over 130 is only held by 2% of the population. Therefore, it's abnormal. Whereas this definition says that, yes, it deviates slightly from social norms, but it's a desirable behaviour. And that's really what makes it a more effective definition than statistical infrequency, because it allows us to distinguish between what is desirable and what isn't desirable behaviour. And that's a major, major strength.